Hello, this is Mike. Welcome back to Bitfixer. We're looking at part two of building a new retro computer. And we're using an ESP32-S3 microcontroller with Wi-Fi to uh, simulate a CPU. And uh, we're gonna see what we can do as far as building out our capabilities here. Uh, last time we built a VGA driver. And if you haven't seen the first video, you might wanna go back and check that out. I'll have a link for you in the description. And uh, right now I'm just running through a VGA demo uh, using that VGA driver. So we're going to start out today, we're going to connect a uh, USB keyboard like this one and, uh, and then we're going to put together something to make a simulated CPU and uh, see if we can make it behave more like a computer. So let's get started. So for the USB keyboard, fortunately uh, Expressive provides us with example code that does almost everything we want. This is a USB HID example, so a human interface device. And this gives us, um, it provides us with the way to connect a uh, USB keyboard or mouse. Um, and it basically handles everything we want to do. Um, and thankfully the S3 has the ability to act as a USB host in addition to a USB device. So um, it could, it can behave as a device where you connect it and it acts like a storage device, USB stick kind of thing. But it can also behave as a host, so you can connect USB devices to it, like a keyboard and mouse. So uh, yeah, this is the example here. And uh, what I've done is I've taken that and I've put that as an ESP IDF component. And uh, if you're not familiar with the way the ESP IDF works, uh, the components are basically just chunks of code that uh, they can be managed by this by the build system themselves. Those are there's some managed components, or you can manually put them into the components directory here. And all you need is uh, you need two files here. There's this components.mk component.mk sorry, and then the cmakelists.txt. And here you just specify the source files you want to include, include directories, and then uh, it can have other requirements of other uh, other components here. And more or less, this is pretty close to exactly what we had in the uh, example code, except I did have to add a few things to handle um, additional keys, like the uh, the arrow keys, I believe, weren't handled, and uh, possibly the enter key. I'm not sure, actually. Um, and I wrapped it up into this uh, C++ class here, so you can initialize your keyboard, you can get um, you can retrieve the latest keys that were pressed and it will handle up to four keys down at once. Um, that's not a capability of the driver itself. That's just something, this is a limitation I put in there. And uh, so therefore you can just, you can run this and you can get, uh, you just keep asking it what keys have been pressed and then it will tell you. And um, in order to demonstrate that, I'll show you a little bit of what I built out here on the demo. So we're running, we're running the VGA demo, as I was saying. Um, I will just switch it over to typewriter mode. And uh, I'll just build and run again. In case you're curious, I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code with the uh, ESP IDF plugin installed. Um, the ESP IDF plugin is, I've had mixed results with it. it uh, it does allow you to have a terminal window uh, right in the uh, right in the VS Code uh, as a VS Code panel here, but uh, I've had some problems actually building. Um, has some build tools in here that didn't seem like they always worked for me, but uh, you can run it. You can run everything from the command line here in the terminal. So yeah, idf.py, and I'm rebuilding everything. Some warnings I need to take care of here. And then you can just see the process here. It's build, it's rewriting the, uh, it's writing the code to the device, and then we'll start up again. And I've got everything just connected here to this VGA breakout board. And uh, now we're booted up to our TV typewriter example. So hopefully you can see that. All right, here's a slightly better view of the uh, TV typewriter here. Uh, Try and use stuff with the uh, recording here, so just uh, please bear with me until I get that, uh, learn that a little better. Uh, another note here with the USB keyboard is that the, the previous 
breakout board I was using, the Pro S3 by Unexpected Maker, uh, it turns out that this one does not have two of the pins brought out that are necessary for for the uh, USB host. Um, they're connected sort of indirectly through this, the uh, USB-C connector here and I was able to get it to work by soldering two tiny little wires here on um, on one of the parts, I'm not sure which it was, but uh, the wires just keep kept coming off because the the area that you have to solder to is just way too small. So uh, I ended up getting this other breakout board. Um, I'll put a link to that in the description. This one, it's a uh, it was very cheap, it seems to work fine, uh, and it does have those pins that I needed. So that was fortunate. Um, so what's next here? So uh, now we have something that. Uh, more or less just acts like a typewriter, but uh, we want to go a little beyond that and add a simulated CPU so we can make this behave more like a retro computer. So why do we need to do that? So your good old 8-bit CPUs like the 6502 Z80, typically the way that those computers are structured is that you have the CPU connected to some RAM, some external RAM, and uh, RAM and ROM, and the, uh, some decoding logic. So based on what addresses you're looking at, you activate the right chips. You activate the RAM, the ROM, or uh, your I.O. as well. Uh, so reading reading from keyboard, writing to screen, etc. Um, and in a microcontroller like the S3, typically most of that stuff is internal to the unit itself. So uh, the instructions that are read from the S3's CPU, if you will, um, they are typically written in internal flash memory and uh, so the instructions are kind of separate from data in RAM. It has separate RAM but the uh, it's less easy to mix your instructions instructions and data in the same memory space basically so that, so and that being said the S3 does have the ability to uh, execute instructions from a certain portion of RAM so that's something that might be interesting to look into in the future but um, but for now um, what I'm planning to do is just all that's all that structure the CPU RAM ROM decoding logic is going to be basically in software on the S3 so it so happens that many years ago I made a uh, made an emulator for the uh, digital group computer which is a Z80 based computer from the uh, late 70s uh, you don't hear about these quite as much, but it happened to be the first computer that was in our house. Um, and I just had a sort of fondness for this thing. So uh, at some point, I made up an emulator for it. And it has a simulated Z80 using a library called Z80EX. And you have the, uh, the code for the emulator itself, which uh, is it's fairly straightforward. The, the structure of the digital group computer is such that uh, you use the I.O. instructions from Z80 to read from keyboard and write to the screen and it's basically just an in and an out instruction so you you write an out to address one I believe just writes a character straight to the screen and then if you do an in from I think it's also an in from address one if I'm not mistaken that reads from the keyboard which is just the parallel ASCII 8-bit uh, keyboard that's connected and uh, so what I'm going to do is take this, I'm going to try to port this over to the uh, S3 and then uh, that will be sort of a jumping off point for us to get uh, a CPU running. And by doing this we'll get a, uh, we'll get a simulated C Z80 CPU running on the S3. Let's go back to our code here. I didn't make this as a component but maybe I can do that in the future. But we have a, a DG EMU directory, the Z80EX is the Z80 emulator. Um, and the structure of this is you have the opcodes are handled in their own C files here and the digital group emulator itself is it only has a few functions there's uh, basically this you initialize it you you can uh, call the step function to make it do something and then you can interface the uh, keyboard by calling the key down function that just tells you that you've called uh, that you've actually pressed the key and um, you have to give it some RAM, so you have to initialize a block of memory here. Uh, one note here is that this this is something that uh, is something to be aware of when you're 
running stuff on the S3 is just the, the regular malloc function will, uh, by default, it will allocate memory in the main memory of the, the S3, which is pretty limited. You have under 512k there, so 64k is actually a significant portion of that. So um, it's a little bit faster than allocating in the, there's an external SPI connected RAM that you can use. Um, but for this one, just for the speed, I'm using internal RAM here. And um, so let's see this thing running. So basically what happens is you start up, it initializes a Z80 processor. And then every time you call a DG step, uh, you go ahead, it calls the C80 EX step, which actually executes an instruction uh, that you've loaded into the uh, memory connected to that virtual CPU. And, and then you can read the keyboard, you decide which key you've pressed, and then you behave accordingly. And one other thing to note is that, um, let's look at the ROM, the actual ROM of the DG digital group. So this is more or less a clone of the the actual ROM in the machine, which is, uh, it's what they call the cassette ROM. And then that is, that's designed to uh, load up and try to load its operating system from a uh, cassette. So um, I just ripped the whole, the whole thing here, except that the, there's a subroutine here, read byte. And we see commented out here is the original. And this, uh, this would actually go through and do the operations necessary to read data from the cassette card on the machine. I've zeroed it all out and replaced everything with just a single, uh, this is just an in, and a, uh, you're reading in from port one. So I guess that's not the keyboard, it's the cassette. So an in from port one means that you, uh, you read a single byte from your IO port uh, and then what I'm doing here is so basically you, when it's trying to read a byte from cassette, instead I just, um, I'll capture that in operation and I'll provide the bytes that you've read from, in this case, it's going to be from an SD card. So let's actually go ahead and give this a try. We'll eventually make this easier to switch, but for now I just change something in code and then rebuild it. And that decides what mode we're going to start up in. All right, so we're starting up in the digital group emulator. Those numbers you see at the beginning are loading from what it thinks is the cassette, but it's actually just loading straight from the SD card. And we start up with the uh, game Kingdom. So uh, see our keyboard works. And we're executing, so in this case, we're executing Z80 code that's loaded into uh, a memory map that we've allocated on the S3's internal memory. And it's working. So this is the uh, digital group emulator running on uh, the SP32 S3. And you can run, uh, you know, any, there's, I, one of the problems here is I don't have that much software for the digital group, but uh, you can run any of that. But uh, like I was saying in the previous video, I didn't, the goal of this project is not really to emulate one specific uh, retro machine, but more to create something new that is in the kind of the spirit of, a, of an old computer. So. Uh, but now we have the ability to uh, use the Z80 processor, but let's take it one one more step. Let's try to uh, run something with a virtual 6502. And specifically what I'm going to do is try to emulate a Commodore PET, um, at least in a very rudimentary way. I'm going to take a simulate 6502 and then get the PET ROMs in and uh, see what we can go from there. So I've chosen to use a uh, 6502 uh, simulator called Fake 6502, which I've modified slightly to uh, make it run faster. Uh, basically, the uh, Fake 6502 is fairly straightforward. I think it was originally meant, uh, it was originally designed for use in an NES emulator. So hence you have this NES CPU flag but it also provided um, tracking of exact cycle counts. But it turned out that in actually doing that, uh, doing that tracking slowed down the execution significantly. So I removed that stuff, or at least uh, put it behind a define, and then uh, just did some optimization on here 
so that uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of operations in each of these opcode handlers. They're just doing more work than we needed to do. So, um, and I'll show you where we're starting out here. Our entry point is a run 6502, and right here um, we are reading the ROMs from we're reading the character ROM first, and then we execute a new task which runs the simulated 6502. We initialize our VGA, and we'll just go here to the 6502 task. And here I am reading in my ROMs from the SD card. So these are all the ROMs of a basic four Commodore PET. And then we have a loop here where we execute several 6502 instructions and then read the keyboard. So the reason I have this strange structure here is I, um, this is sort of a partially unrolled loop for speed. Um, if you just run one instruction and then read the keyboard every single time, it's less efficient. You're reading the keyboard more often than you really need to. And uh, I just wanted to see how fast I could get it to run. Um, but anyhow, let's start this up and see our Commodore PET emulation working as well. So I have my CPU 6502 mode and start it up again. And there you go. So uh, again we have a 64k memory map, we have a simulated 6502 processor, and then we have the uh, contents of the ROMs that would be in a Commodore PET running basic 4.0. And it's, it's not 100% emulation. Um, you could not interface with any hardware, for example. I don't have a good way to load a program yet, and I don't have a cursor on the screen, but you can type in, I can type in the program here. And run it. I don't even know if I. Oops. There you go. So we have a. You can type in your programs and run them. Yeah, I just don't have a good way to load or save programs yet. So um, I'm not sure how much further I'll go with the Commodore PET emulation here. But now we have a choice. We have a simulated 6502, we have a simulated Z80, um, and we have a form of BASIC that you can run. What I really like to do next, I think I'd find a basic or a basic like language that we can build on one of those processors. And then we're going to, I think in the next installment, we'll be building out the ROM for this machine. Um, and that will be basically just designing all the operations we want to handle. And some of it are going to be graphical operations, some of it will be sound. Uh, sound is probably the next thing we have to do hardware wise and uh, possibly make a layout for this uh, on a real uh, PCB instead of on the breadboard like that. And one other note about the uh, pet emulation pet emulation here is um, when I first ran this I wasn't uh, when I wasn't yet handling the uh, IO addresses on the pet between addresses E8 E800 and E8FF hex uh, those are all I.O. addresses, so they're not something that would read or write to uh, memory. And at first when I was running this, I, would, I was clearing the RAM to zero. And uh, let's just, I'll just do a little demonstration here. When you run that, I didn't have no special handling in the I.O. area yet, so um, when you ran that, you get something a little different. Uh, so as you can see, without handling the uh, I.O. addresses properly, you boot straight out to the uh, machine language monitor here. Uh, so it's essentially a crash. Um, and I eventually found out that uh, when you're reading the I.O. space, it's address E8, E810 hex. Uh, that's when it's, um, it is one of the, it's one of the chips in the pet. Um, I'll have to look up which one that is, but it expects you, um, if you read a zero, it crashes basically, but if you read an FF, it does not crash. So, interesting little thing there. 
And yeah, and you've, if you read FF from that address, you boot right up to the uh, basic prompt. I'm just looking up here on that address. Say E E810 to E813 is PIA1 keyboard I/O. So one of the bits, one or more of the bits on E810. Uh, basically, if you read to zero, then it uh, it's not what it expects, and it crashes out to the machine language monitor. And just for fun, let's take a look at the Lunar Lander game on the digital group. That's a good example of the glorious world of animation on that digital group computer, which is, uh, certainly see it was not meant for fast screen updates because when you run the, um, there's a Z80 instruction. If you do an out instruction to the screen, it just writes a new character to the memory on the TV card in the computer and uh, it's one at a time. If you want to clear the screen, you have to write space characters to the entire buffer to clear it all out and move the move the cursor forward. So you'll see with this Lunar Lander game, uh, you'll see <laughs> exactly how nice and smooth the animation is on that computer. And here you can see an example of uh, on the digital group. Typically programs will come up and they'll have the Z80 operating system so basically there's a little tiny operating system in memory and then the actual program you want to run is there too and you can pick it from a menu here so hit seven for lunar lander I'll wait a little bit and there we go yeah this brings me to another topic which is how fast this is running so the digital group itself runs at 2.5 megahertz Commodore PET runs at, I believe, 1 megahertz um, CPU frequencies for the Z80 and 6502 processors. This is definitely running faster. Um, it's uh, it's probably running, this one's probably running like three or four times the speed on the digital group and on the PET. Um, the PET actually did some timing. Uh, I did a basic program Print, print out 1, 2,000 and compare the time on the PET and it's running about six times as fast. So that would be about six megahertz virtual speed. Um, I'm pretty sure it is possible to go even faster than that if you do some tricks like uh, emulating the CPU in assembly language as opposed to C using the ESP IDFC library. Um, that's not something I've really gotten into yet, but uh, perhaps in the future uh, that might be interesting. But uh, it did run fairly slow at first until going through that fake CPU program and uh, optimizing it and taking out all the unnecessary operations. Um, and the Z80 emulator seems to run reasonably fast. It probably could be optimized as well. I haven't really done any timing on that one. But anyway, I think that'll just about do it on this installment of building a new retro computer. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me while I show you the progress on the project. And uh, we'll be back again soon with uh, more, hopefully more additions here, uh, possibly a new board, possibly adding sound, and uh, I would like to try to add in some, some, some other form of basic or language of that sort on here to uh, really build, you know, start building up my own ROM on here to just see where it goes from there. Thanks, and see you next time.